Warmer temperatures over time are changing weather patterns and disrupting the usual balance of nature. This poses many risks to human beings and all other life forms on Earth. That pretty much sums up what this presentation is about, which is climate change and where we're at with climate change as a species in 2022. The agenda for this presentation is that I'm going to explain who I am, what climate change is, what causes climate change, the history of climate change, climate change in the area of the United States that I live in, which is the Southwest. I'll give you a brief summary, and then I have a list of references. Who am I and why am I doing this presentation? I'm an animal lover and an advocate for optimizing animal well-being. I work as an animal trainer and behaviorist, as well as an animal caretaker. So why am I doing a presentation about climate change? Because climate change, both natural and anthropogenic, impacts all animals. Human-mediated climate change, which is that anthropogenic climate change, creates circumstances that impact animals, and the animals have no say in what's going on, and they have no control over it. So as a voice for animals, I'm talking to you today about climate change. For the health and welfare of Earth and all life on it, mitigation and prevention of human caused harmful climate change is everybody's business. What is climate change? It's an overall semi permanent or long term change in weather for an area or an entire planet. So, climate change would be if an entire planet for all of you science fiction fans out there, I love science fiction, so imagine a whole planet that's a desert planet. It's barren, it's desolate, it's hot, it's dry, and something happen happens to the atmosphere, or maybe aliens come and they change the weather on that planet, and now it's lush, and it's green, and it has liquid water on it, and life can thrive there. And so it went from being a dry, desolate desert planet to one that can sustain life, and it's pleasant to be there. That's what climate change is. Or imagine here on Earth, a lush meadow, a grassy field. There's green grass there, there's trees growing, there's birds flying, there's little mammals hopping around. And suddenly something happens and it never rains there again. And now what used to be a lush meadow has turned into a scorched Earth. It's desolate, it's dry, it's a desert for the rest of history. That is what climate change is. Climate change is not those short-term fluctuations in weather from day to day, or the short-term fluctuations in weather with the changing seasons. It's a very permanent long-term deal. So now that I've told you who I am and what climate change is, the rest of this presentation is gonna be about what causes climate change, its history, how climate change is impacting the Southwest during the United States, a summary of everything and then references. And I encourage you to look at these references for yourself and take the time to learn for yourself and research for yourself. Don't just take my word for these things. Some of the references are listed at the bottom of the slides and that's gonna be if the information is just pretty much on that one slide. Let's talk about what causes climate change. Forcing agents. Those are the things that drive climate. So in relation to climate change, forcing agents or climate drivers are those things that are pushing the climate into that altered state. They're moving it in one direction or another, from hot to cold or cold to hot, from dry to wet or wet to dry. And there are both natural causes and anthropogenic causes to climate change. So some forcing agents or climate drivers that are naturally occurring are things like volcanic eruptions, meteor impacts, and severe winds. And these things can cause ash and dust to enter the atmosphere, impacting not only the temperature, but air quality. So something similar to that, that is human caused, would be aerosols and soot entering the atmosphere, causing in, an impact to air quality and causing temperatures to rise or fall. And those aerosols and soot would come from things that humans create, like vehicle emissions, manufacture chemicals, or chimneys. So another climate driver is the amount of cloud cover that is or isn't present in the atmosphere. So the clouds that we see, those beautiful fluffy clouds, or those ominous dark rain-filled clouds that we see in the sky, filter the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth's surface. 
And an increase in dense cloud cover can cool the surface by limiting the amount of solar radiation that reaches it, or it can warm the surface by preventing heat from escaping into space. And that's going to depend on some other factors, which I will talk about shortly. Something equivalent to that, that's a human driver of climate change, would be modifications to the environment itself, the land itself. So land use changes that humans do. So they may um, cut down a forest and instead of a really thick canopy of trees covering the land, now that's gone and that land is barren because it's been logged or the land is barren and being used to farm cattle. And so now that land that was protected by that lush canopy of trees isn't protected by that and more solar radiation is reaching the earth. And you'll notice now that I have greenhouse gases on both the natural causes and the anthropogenic causes. And that's because there are natural reasons why greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, but we also add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. That's what we're gonna talk about in more detail next. Greenhouse gases are chemicals that include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and they are produced naturally, but they're also produced artificially by us, by human activities. So Earth's energy balance, which impacts its temperature, is maintained by the incoming solar or short wave radiation from the sun that reaches the surface of the Earth, and then by outgoing terrestrial or long wave radiation that leaves the atmosphere. Well, greenhouse gases absorb that incoming solar energy and they trap it in the atmosphere. So rather than escaping back out into space, the trapped solar energy builds up on the planet and it increases the heat down here. So the bottom line is that greenhouse gases trap heat here on Earth. Well, when more of these greenhouse gases are present due to our human activities, the nature would produce itself it results in an overall warming of the planet. This can create an out of control feedback loop. So feedbacks in relation to climate change can be negative or positive. And so when we refer to a feedback in climate change, it is something that either speeds up or slows down the current warming trend that we're experiencing right now. So Earth is experiencing a warming trend. So a positive feedback is going to be something that accelerates that temperature rise and a negative feedback is going to be something that slows down the temperature rise. And I thought one of the best examples of this was the melting of Arctic sea ice or the melting of glaciers. So let's look at this little circular chart that I've got on the slide. And if you look at it, it's all initiated by humans releasing CO2 into the atmosphere above what would naturally occur. And when that happens, when we have more CO2 in the atmosphere than what nature would produce or allow to be here, it traps more of that solar radiation in the atmosphere and it causes Earth to get hotter. Well then, because the planet's hotter, glaciers melt, Arctic sea ice melts, and it creates more water and less ice. Well, ice is very light colored and it reflects more of that solar radiation into space. Water is very dark colored and it absorbs more solar radiation or heat down here onto our planet. And so then the earth gets even hotter. And now we've created this forward moving positive feedback loop that gets out of control because even though the CO2 gases in the atmosphere initiated this in the first place, now the melting of the ice is causing a rise in sea level. That rise in sea level or the added water and the reduction in ice is causing the planet to heat up all on its own. The Earth's getting even hotter. The ice is melting even more. And so now we have this loop that's just out of control in an ever present warming direction of sea ice melting, more water present more sun being absorbed by that water, the earth is getting hotter, it's melting more ice, and that loop is gonna continue unless something interjects to change it. Now, here is an example of positive and negative feedback loops that can be in relation to cloud cover. And I told you I was gonna talk more about this in a minute. So let's look at this circle on the left. And the initial change warms the climate. 
And that could be us adding more carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and trapping that solar radiation down here on Earth. So that's going to increase atmospheric water vapor. It's going to increase the greenhouse trapping of radiation. It's going to increase the cloud cover and make it more dense. And it's going to increase warming, which in turn is going to just keep this warming trend going. But something else that can happen with cloud cover, if you don't have the other factors already present down here on the planet warming it for other reasons, is that you could have a meteor impact or a volcanic eruption that adds soot and dust and other particulate matter to the cloud cover. And in you've got increased cloud cover, you've got maybe increased evaporation, so there's less moisture in the clouds that are present, but there's more soot and ash and dirt. So that decreases the amount of sun that's hitting the earth and it cools the earth's surface. And without these other factors heating the earth's surface, it just gets colder and colder. That's not what's happening now. What's happening right now is we're in this ever moving forward feedback loop of warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer because there are a whole lot of factors playing into that. So the history of climate change on Earth isn't all human caused. We've had five large scale mass extinctions that have occurred over the last 450 million years. And a large body of evidence suggests that these climate change contributed to these mass extinction events. So let's take a closer look at two of these events. The Permian Triassic mass extinction, which was about 250 years ago. It occurred during a very short time in geologic terms, about 60, thousand years and it was associated with rapid warming and so here's an example where rapid global warming warming caused 96 percent of all living species to be eliminated from the planet and then con in contrast to that about 440 million years ago we had the end ordovician mass extinction and it was related to a global cooling event and about 85 percent of all species went extinct so natural causes, natural processes in geologic history can cause global warming or global cooling. However, that's not what's happening right now. Right now, all evidence suggests that we humans are causing global warming. We are causing a climate change trend in a warmer direction, and we have this positive feedback loop now going on where things are just getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And I have this little picture of the tardigrade here because this little guy, maybe not this specific one, but his species, survived all five of the major mass extinctions. So way to go tardigrades, also called water bears, which is super cute. Here's just a brief look at the history of anthropogenic climate change, or at least our awareness of it as a species. Way back in 1896, the idea of burning fossil fuel and that that was adding CO2 or carbon dioxide to the atmosphere was first proposed. And then in 1903, so right around the turn of the century, people first took notice that the Earth's Atlantic Ocean region was significantly becoming warmer. Now we jump ahead about 50 years to the 1950s and 60s, where now some measurements corroborated the idea that Earth was warming because of greenhouse gases. So then in 1970, the Clean Air Act was passed by the Congress of the United States and the first Earth Day celebration happened. And that's, I believe, always April 22nd every year. And then the last 20 years from 2001 to the present, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change established or came to a consensus on human-induced climate change. So they came to a consensus that said, yes, humans are inducing climate change right now. And we actually had our two hottest years on record, 2019 and 2020. So let's take a historical look at climate change in the American Southwest, which for the purposes of this presentation are Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. But some sources are going to consider the Southwest um, also like Texas and California and other states. But I live in Colorado and Colorado actually had its warmest day on record on July 20th, 2019, 115 degrees. It's the hottest temperature ever recorded in Colorado since we've been recording temperatures. So what in the world is happening? 
Well, the American Southwest has been experiencing higher than average temperatures for basically the last 20 years. Between 2000 and 2020, the, the American Southwest experienced higher temperatures on average than the whole time between 1895 and 2020, and that averaged about two degrees warmer. And the Southwest has also been experiencing drought conditions since 2000, so about the last 20 years. And that has included extended periods of abnormal dryness. So from 2002 to 2005, for three years, there was a really long period of extended abnormal dryness. And then between 2012 and 2020, so eight years, and we're actually still in that drought right now. The Southwest has experienced wet conditions over the years. So in the early 1900s, the 1940s, and in the 1980s, Colorado and parts of the Southwest actually experienced flooding. But what's happening right now with the flooding situation is we are in this massive drought, but we do occasionally get rain. And when that rain comes all at once, and when that rain impacts on Earth, that is so dry and hard, it can't absorb the moisture as it comes down, we get flash flooding. And so while it sounds weird that while we're in a drought, there's a risk of flooding, it happens because the earth isn't able to absorb the moisture as it's raining down. And we usually get this extreme weather event where we'll get a whole bunch of rain at once and then no rain for months and months. And that also contributes to these flooding events. And then the Southwest experienced dry conditions during the 1920s and the 1950s, and it's still experiencing drought conditions now. If you look at this picture, this is from Lake Powell, Arizona, and it shows the water lines over the last several years. This was taken in 2015, and you can see how low the water is or was at that time, and it's not getting any better. This, of course, is going to end up having a socioeconomic impact on the American Southwest. The picture that I've chosen to put here is showing the home of the Ute Mountain Indians. It's a tribe, tribal reservation in the Southwest. And this was taken on November 18th of 2021 during an extreme drought in that area. So the socioeconomic impacts to Southwestern communities from both sea level rise for those that are near water or from drought are going to go beyond losses to just buildings, properties, and infrastructure, but they're going to impact the community, the culture, the recreational activities, and they're going to impact the community and the people in it financially. So part of the Southwest identity is very tied to outdoor activities, and the region is very invested in recreational and commercial activities that include hiking, camping, fishing, skiing, rafting, zip lining, horseback riding. And in areas where large bodies of water are present, it also includes boating and related activities like fishing or canoeing. Southwestern culture is also deeply tied to its land, its art, its native peoples and crafts, its historical sites and the cultural events, many of which are held outside. So the outlook for this area isn't really good. Extreme heat and drought will impact the activities that I listed above, most of which are outdoor related activities or dependent on water. In 2021, the persistent drought that scientists believe is the driest 22 year stretch in the past 1200 years hit Colorado farmers and ranchers really hard. I'll talk more about that shortly. But the outlook as of April of 2022, as this area is heading into spring and summer, and the local government and agricultural community of the Southwest is very concerned about the dry conditions here. All right, here are some more specifics about local impacts. I said I would talk more about farming and ranching, and what's happening is water for livestock, for irrigating crops, and for grazing land is limited. And so people with junior water rights are getting only about 10% of the water they need in order to function, in order to water their animals, in order to irrigate their crops, in order to irrigate land for grazing their cattle and other animals. Water rights are becoming a big deal here because those with senior water rights are the ones getting what little water we have. That means that those who don't have those water rights or aren't getting enough of the water are going out of business and aren't able to maintain. 
So water dependent recreation is also affected. Obviously boating, whitewater rafting, fishing, any similar water related activities are in decline or shutting down. So there have been years recently where whitewater rafting just wasn't happening here in Colorado. So the whitewater rafting industry basically plummeted. Hiking, visiting outdoor historical sites, those are things that are really difficult to do in extreme heat. So the extreme heat, the extreme winds that sometimes accompany the extreme heat and dryness are impacting the desirability of these outdoor activities like hiking, trail use, visiting landmarks, camping, and people just aren't doing them. And that's a huge part of tourism here. And then wildlife is deeply impacted because if we have dry conditions, windy conditions, resources are gonna be limited. And so that's gonna cause die-offs, that's gonna cause wildlife to migrate out of the area or to encroach on urban areas or human settlements. So what's the outlook? Does the future look bright for the Southwest? The future looks fiery and hot for the Southwest. The fire danger right now is extreme. So let's take a look at the most recent statistics or the most recent projected outlook. As of April 26, 2022, the drought in the Southwest is continuing and 54% of the United States overall remains in a drought. 20% of the United States is in the two worst categories of drought, which is extreme and exceptional. And that's a two to 3% increase compared to the same time in March. So remember these stats are from April. So just a month before it's already two to 3% worse. And 91% of the Southwest and the West is experiencing drought. That's the brown part on this map. Anyway, 37% in extreme or exceptional drought and an increase from March. So things are going to continue to get warmer, they're going to continue to get drier, they're going to continue to get windier. And then if we do get rain, it's likely going to cause flash flooding. The weather outlook for the Southwest, extreme heat, continued drought, high winds. All of that, again, can cause flash flooding if we do get a day or two of rain. And then if we're not getting any rain at all, and in between the freak rain showers, we're going to have extreme fire danger. We have, we have severe fire danger going on in Colorado right now. And then when we do have wildfires or worse, if we have structure fires, the air quality becomes very, very poor and it's difficult for people and animals to breathe and work outside. The way of life in the Southwest is absolutely being impacted and will be impacted in the future by farms and ranches shutting down boating, rafting, and swimming shutting down, hiking, horseback riding, camping, visits to outdoor historic sites becoming limited or people just not wanting to do them, and then a higher cost of living and increased prices of things like hay, grains, produce, and other crops because of the drought, the windy conditions. It's all a cascading effect. This brings us to wages, and wages are unlikely to increase because businesses reliant on things like tourism or outdoor recreation are either shutting down or they're having a reduction in their business revenue. And then a higher cost of living and increased cost of many items is going to reduce how far wages are going to be able to go. So what can be done? What can we do about this? It sounds horrible. Well, we can do things to mitigate it and we're going to have to adapt our behavior in order to combat this issue, which we caused in the first place, I wanna remind you. This is from Green America and I put this here because it's just five quick, simple things that everybody should be able to do. Buy less and share more, eat less meat, kick the plastic and bottle habit. I am drinking boxed water. Mm. It's really good. And we have been producing beverages in cartons for a really long time, like milk and orange juice. So I don't know why more water companies are not going with the boxed water. Use LED lighting in your home and say no to toxic paper receipts, etc. But I wanted to share this with you because I thought this was fantastic. This is from Geneva Fox, who's an instructor at Pikes Peak State College in their zookeeping program. And she teaches a birds class. And in this last semester, which just ended this week, 
She asked her class to each go up and write one thing on the board about how can we help birds and protect nature. And as I was looking at this photo she shared, I was reading through this and thinking, people were writing things up here on how we could protect birds and protect nature, but so many of these things are relevant to climate change and mitigating climate change and reducing climate change and things that we can all do, like recycle, throw away trash, stay on trails to protect the vegetation, take shorter showers, reduce our consumption in general, planting flowers. Um, somebody wrote ecotourism, not exploitation, um, signing petitions, write your elected representative, compost, so many of these things are not just ways that we can protect birds and nature, but protect the whole planet. So I thought this was a really great thing to share. And these are things that we can all do. So in summary, climate change is a long-term permanent or semi-permanent alteration of the normal general weather conditions, such as an ice planet turning into a water planet or a water planet turning into a desert planet or a desert turning into a lush green space. The current trend for planet Earth, unfortunately, is a warming direction that's causing increased temperatures, drought in some places and flooding in others, which has a cascading impact, resulting in land loss, resource loss, poor air quality, temperature extremes, temperature extremes that are difficult for humans and other animals to function within. And then climate change can be natural, However, evidence suggests the current warming trend is human caused and can only be mitigated or halted by humans through behavior change and scientific innovation. These are some references that I encourage you to look up for yourselves. Don't take my word for these things. Take the time to research and read for yourself. Make your own decisions. Think for yourself. Thank you so much for your time. If you have further questions for me, you can reach me at behaviorducationllc at gmail.com or on my website at behavioreducation.org. I can also be reached through Unity College at lturini20 at unity.edu. And I can be found on social media, which includes Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and I think that's it. But if I'm forgetting one, I'm probably there. So until we meet again, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals.